Hello, and welcome to this broadcast, sponsored by First Baptist Church Summit, where we are leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known. We are excited about how God is moving in His church here at Summit, and we invite you to spend the next few minutes worshiping with us through the study of God's Word. Here's our pastor, Dr. Larry LeBlanc. You got your Bibles, take them and open with me again to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31 tonight. I'm glad to be back at First Baptist Summit. Um, you are a good-looking group of folks. I'm glad to be back. I appreciate you allowing me to be gone this morning. It's always enjoyable to have the privilege and honor to preach in other pulpits, but this little black one's my favorite. Uh, and so I am glad to be back tonight and glad to be with you all and excited about sharing God's Word with you tonight. When we think about self-image and self-worth, it is a huge issue. Um, I was preaching several years back at A Disciple Now, and as I was there and I had the chance to share with some students and some young men and women, I was overcome by some of the conversations that I had, and I recognized that everything I had prepared to preach that weekend, I needed to throw away and I needed to start over. And where I started over was Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Because as we look at a world where people are dying because they don't understand how valuable they are, how worthwhile they are, where young women don't understand how beautiful they are and how made in God's image and glorious they are, where young men don't understand that they have what it takes because the image of God is born onto their lives and onto their soul, and we have people that are dealing with depression and throwing their lives away, where suicide and drug use and all of those things are at all-time highs. I believe that that is the very, the root cause of all of that is because we have yet to understand as a society how absolutely vital it is to see that the image of God is born on every individual that comes into this world. To understand that there is life and there is worth and that there is value. And the reason that this series of understanding beginnings and origins is so important is because the difference in, under, in having a biblical philosophy, a biblical worldview, and a naturalistic or an atheistic worldview is enormous. Let me give you just an illustration of that as we get started tonight. I want you to contrast these two worldviews. One is from a man by the name of Lawrence Krauss. He's an atheistic phys physicist and cosmologist. And this is his view on humanity. Lawrence Krauss. I have found little that is good about human beings on the whole. In my experience, most of them are trash, no matter whether they publicly subscribe to this or that ethical doctrine or not at all. Human beings are just a bit of pollution. If you got rid of us and all the stars and all the galaxies and all the planets and all the aliens and everybody, then the universe would be largely the same. We're completely irrelevant. That is where atheism will take you every time. That is where naturalism will take you every time, that you are nothing better than a speck or a dot in the universe, and you're irrelevant, and you're not worthwhile. When we take that and see how that, that has borne fruit and come to fruition in the heart and lives of so many people, now generation after generation of teaching that and buying into that worldview, it's no wonder that we have such a dilemma in what we see in our nation and in our world. I want you to contrast that with the words of G.K. Chesterton. Simply put, all men matter. You matter, I matter. Let me say that again. All men matter. You matter, and I matter. You read the Bible, that's where, it, that's where you get can you see the stark contrast in believing that you are nothing more than a bit of pollution and believing that your life matters because you bear the image of the Imago Dei or of the image of God? I want you to see that in Genesis chapter 1. Stand with me. Let's read Genesis 1 together. Genesis 1, I begin in verse 26. We see the Trinitarian concept even coming out in verse 26 when God speaks of Himself in a plurality as far as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit coming together. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all of the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. 
God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all of the beasts of the earth and to all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw, verse 31, all that He had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. Thank You, Lord, that I bear Your image. And that, Lord, that makes my life valuable and worthwhile. Teach us the importance of bearing that image tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. What does it mean that we bear the image of God? Well, let's understand what it does not mean. It does not, obviously, we know that God does not have a physical body. Even though there are features of God that are described in physical ways, we know that God is spirit. So it is not in a physical way that we look like God or bear the image of God, but that we possess a spiritual capacity that differentiates us from every animal in creation. We have a moral capacity that differentiates us from every other animal. We know and worship God, which differentiates us from all of the animal, plant life, fish fish of the sea, and birds of the air. As spiritual beings, we have a desire for a fellowship with God, and the more we understand God, the more we understand what it is to be in His image. Now, friends, we know that we have gone through the fall, but in the fall, the image was not lost, but simply distorted. So we go back to the very beginning and ask the implications of being made in the image of God. Bearing God's image affects our valuing of life, our gender roles, and understanding our dominion over all of the earth. First of all, the value of life itself. Look at verse 26 and 27. So man was created in the very image of God, in the likeness of God. It says that God made us. We're asked so often, why did God make the world? I'm asked that all the time. Children will ask that question. Adults ask that question. Why did God create? Why did God make man? I'll give you the answer that I was given growing up. I was always told it was for fellowship. How many of you heard that growing up? That God made the world so he would have so he could be in fellowship with humankind. That's a nice thought, it's just wrong. And here's why. Because to say that God needed to make the world to be in fellowship would mean that God was incomplete in His fellowship and the Trinitarian unity that He already had. God didn't need to make you because He was lonely. That's a disturbing way to see God the Father, that He made you because He thought, you know, I'm just bored. I don't have anybody to talk to, nobody to get along with. But you know what? I think I'll make her. Because if I make her, then everything in my life will be complete because I'm incomplete without them. How arrogant. God made it just fine through all eternity past without you and without me. So when God brought humanity into existence, it was not for fellowship. It was simply for His own glory. Isaiah 43 verse 7 says, Everyone who is called by my name, I created for my glory. Simply put, why did God create the world? Why did God create you? And this is the best answer I know. Because He wanted to. Because He wanted to. And because out of His sovereignty and glory, that was His prerogative. And so we're important, not because God needed us, but because He gave us the significance of marking us with the very image of God so that when we look in the mirror, not just physically, but when we see the imprint that's been placed on our soul, we see that our human life is the most impressions, the most precious thing in all of creation. It's not the stars of the heavens. It's not the sun. It's not the planetary systems. It's not the oceans. It's not the fish. It's not the birds. It's not anything else in all of the universe. Watch this. Humanity, you and I, are the apex of all creation. One of the reasons that we've gotten so far off track is we have people that will argue that the life of humanity is no different than the life of a dog. 
or the life of an ape or the life of a redwood tree. When friends, biblically in Genesis chapter 1, I have no problem with arguing that my life is more valuable than every other bit of animal creation. That's not because I'm arrogant. It's because the one who made me told me so. God told me I'm valuable. God told me I bear His image. And if God said that about myself, then how dare we look into our lives and not see something that's beautiful and credible and fearfully and wonderfully made. That bears image on every one of you young ladies as you're fighting a battle every day as you see magazines and you see television and you wonder, am I worthwhile? Am I beautiful? Is my life significant? And you need to know, not because your pastor thinks so, I do, but you need to know so because God said so. You're fantastic. You're amazing. You don't need a man to complete you. You don't need a man to fulfill you. You don't need a man or a boyfriend to tell you you're beautiful to have that image. It is because the creator of heaven and earth, the Alpha and Omega and the great I am, when he looks at you, he says, you are gorgeous beyond compare because I own you and I love you and you bear my image. You need to know that. You need to know that when you go to school tomorrow and you doubt yourself and you wonder, the image of God is born onto your life. Young men, it makes a difference for all of us as well too, understanding that you have the very image of God because we have a whole generation of young men that refuse to grow up. We have 30-year-olds that want to play video games all day and not work. People that don't want to get educated and, and don't, don't want to go to work. And, and we ask ourselves, why is that? I believe it's epidemic and it comes from evolution. Because men don't understand that they bear the image of God so their life has value. So they don't understand the importance and the necessity of working hard and believing that they have what it takes. Because the only reason I know I have what it takes isn't because I'm so wonderful. It's because the image of God is on my life. And when you take that away, a worthlessness begins to pervade a culture, and we're reaping what we have sown. It all comes down to this very simple, simple Bible verse, yet so profound, that we bear the image of God. That means that all people must be treated with the respect of being God's image bearer. I have to confess to you that what I'm about to preach and what I'm about to talk to you about is very difficult for me. This is hard. Has been for my whole life. That we live in a world in which people will devalue life based on race, based on sex, based on mental capacity, based on anything else. How dare we? How dare we allow ourselves to be in a culture in which we think that we can decide value when God said that every human life that's ever been born bore the image of God. Red or yellow, black or white, no matter what type or condition that they have, no matter what issue, no matter what age, they are valuable to the King and to God Almighty. And when you pick up a newborn child, I don't care how, what it is that they deal with, what issue that they have, what race that they are. Friends, we need to understand, even in our southern culture, that race is a about nothing other than the amount of melanin in someone's skin. And that when you look at a black child, that a black child is as valuable to God as a white child is. When you look at a child that has mental disabilities, that that child is as valuable to God as as any of the rest of us are. As you look at a child that's athletically gifted, they are no more valuable than someone who is not. Someone who has incredible talent is no more valuable to God than someone who doesn't. And the reason is, is not because of their talent or intellect or color or anything else. It is because before they were formed in their mother's womb, God says he knew them. When we treat people like that, it changes. When you walk through lines and you see people and you experience that no matter what their faults are, they have the imago day placed on their life and you treat people like that, it changes things. It changes things. There are no ordinary people. There are no ordinary people. Yet I had a conversation with my wife over the past several weeks. I got emotional a couple of weeks ago just trying to watch the news. Just trying to watch the news. I don't know if this ever happens with any of your lives. But they must have had a 20-minute special on a national news show about a dentist who went to Africa and killed a lion that he wasn't supposed to. Did you see this news coverage? 
Now, I want to be careful in the way I phrase this. Because I'm not saying he did the right thing or that he should have killed this particular lion or he shouldn't have killed this particular lion. I don't know all the particulars. That's not what I'm here to argue. I'm not his defense lawyer. But what I am here to argue is there's something wrong, wrong, wrong. When on a national news broadcast, we run more about the killing of a lion than we do about the mutilation of the unborn. That is sick. That is sick. And it just goes to show that in a culture where you would value the life of a lion more than you would more than you would value the life of a precious one who bears the image of God, it means that we ought to repent and ask God to forgive us because we've gotten to a whole new place where we've missed the value of God on individual lives. Not only does it affect the value of lives, but it also affects our understanding of gender roles. Look at verse 27. This is a real simple point. Male and female, he created them. God made boys and God made girls. And if you're a man, you ought to celebrate being a man. If you're a woman, you ought to celebrate being a woman. It is that God intended it from the very beginning. Gender roles did not come about after the fall. This is huge. In the perfect creation that God had made before the fall, there was a man and there was a woman. Isn't that incredible? That gender roles from the very beginning were God's idea. That's not chauvinism. That's not feminism. That's design. And yet it has gotten so ridiculous that's how ridiculous it is that we are getting an alert right now letting us know just how ridiculous that it is. But this is how ridiculous that it is. And I'm just, I'm talking about some recent things in current events because I want you to see how tied they are to Scripture. I turned the television off when they gave Bruce Jenner an award for courage for becoming Caitlyn Jenner. Some of you are looking at me right now like, oh no, he's going there. Yes, sir. Yes, because the Bible goes there. And if Bruce Jenner is listening, I want you to know that God loves you. God loves you and you are made in his image, but you were made male. It isn't something that we explore to decide which one we want to be. My identity as a man was decided before I was ever conceived. And as we celebrate those gender differences, we need to be a culture that says, yes, it is okay to teach your young men to act like young men, to teach little boys to act like little boys, and to teach little girls to be feminine and to be young ladies. We need to celebrate that. And this gender neutrality is garbage. God created men and women, boys and girls, biologically, spiritually, roles, and we need to get back to that. That's so simple. When I was 10 years old sitting in church, do you think I ever thought that I would preach a message in which I thought I needed to say that we need to have boys be boys and girls be girls? Because you're growing up in a culture where I saw something the other day about what is this? I want to jazzy or, or whatever this kid that's going to become. And they're celebrating this child who wants to go through a, a sex change or orientation in the whole show. And I'm thinking there's some of you that are growing up right now that are going to battle wondering if that's okay. That's not okay. We used to call stuff weird. Now we can't call it that anymore because that's judgmental. It's not just weird, it's sinful and it's wrong. Biblically, gender roles. It's given by God. Third, third and I'm done. In verse 27 it says, He created them male and female, and he went so far into verse 28 to say that he said to them, not only should you be fruitful and multiply, but take the earth and subdue it, rule over it. 
He all the way back when he said that he gave dominion in verse 26. He repeats it in verse 27. In verse 29, I give you every seed bearing plant. Verse 30, to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has breath or life in it, I give every green plant for food. God is establishing from the very beginning, we find out in chapter 2 that he gave Adam the job of naming the animals, that from the very outset of creation, Pre-fall, man was given something called dominion. We were given the privilege to take this earth and not only fill it or habitate in it, not only be fruitful and multiply, but to use its resources, to consume its resources. When we talk about environmentalists, Christians ought to be environmentalists. Now, my definition of what an environmentalist is and what some people's are are totally different. But we ought to be concerned about our globe and about our world. And when we think about people going green, we ought to be a people who understand that we want the best for our world. But in understanding that, there's nothing wrong with saying that as human beings, we control the resources not because they're ours, but because God allows us to control them. Whether that be oil or water or animals for food. So crazy that we live in a world where organizations like PETA are given a voice without being dismissed is patently ridiculous. We need to revisit man's God-given biblical dominion that we were called to manage and care for the earth, and it's a responsibility that is given to us by God. I get asked the question from time to time, do you like to hunt? Yes, I like to hunt. But Pastor Larry, do you kill things? I mean, you're a preacher. Do you, do you kill things? If I can hit it. <laughs> How do you reconcile that? Genesis 1. God gave me dominion. If I want a deer hunt and I want to shoot a deer, I'm giving that before we get out of the first chapter of Genesis. God gives us dominion over that. But it's not just the deer and deer hunting, but it's about over all creation that we are giving a biblical responsibility to recognize that every creature, every plant is subservient to God's pinnacle of creation, which is not a tree, which is not an owl, which is not a whale, which is not a monkey, which is not a dog. The pinnacle of God's creation alone is mankind. And when we see that, we quit valuing things as if our children had the same value as some domesticated breed of cattle. They were bred to be subservient to humankind that we may have dominion over them and responsibility. We don't have to apologize for that. It is a dominion over the resources of the world that God has given us. When we think about what it means to bear the image of God, it's real simple. It means that you're valuable. You're valuable enough that you bear the image of God. Every one of you in here is either a boy or a girl, I think. Everybody in here, you're one of the two. And you're that on purpose because God made you that way. And that's purpose in God's design. And you've been given them dominion over the earth as the absolute number one pinnacle of God's creation. So you wonder whether your life has value, whether you ought to have self-esteem. Let us make man in our image. Stand with me. Thank you for joining us today. If you want to know more about First Baptist Summit, please visit our website at www.fbcsummit.org or call us at 601-276-2396. Of course, the best way to know more about us is to be our guest on Sunday. Here's our schedule. On Sunday mornings, worship and Sunday school for all ages starts at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. and there's an evening worship service at 6. On Wednesday evenings, our fellowship meal begins at 5 p.m. and activities for all ages start at 6. Again, thanks for joining us today. 
You've been listening to the broadcast of the message portion of our services at First Baptist Summit, where we are leading everyday people to love Jesus and make Him known.